hello everybody. Um, I believe I can start now. Um, we're just trying to manage this over two locations and make sure people are on mute. So forgive me. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, I'm going to be going through this uh, fraud management update for you uh, over the next hour. Um, obviously, we're going to try and squeeze quite a bit of information into this time period. Um, so I'll try and save some time at the end for questions. Uh, but also, you, if you utilize the chat facility on the WebEx, you can post questions uh, where our uh, office helping administrate the call will kind of take note of the questions and bring them forward to the end uh, to my attention. Um, of course, any time you can, if you wish to ask questions as we go through or follow up, please do so via email. Uh, afterwards, after the event. So I'll begin and go through and go through the agenda. Uh, what I'm going to do in this uh, update is go through the uh, latest, uh, well, the fraud surveys and the information that's out there covering various issues that are happening in the industry over the past year, look at which aspects of fraud are on the rise and then look at where we seem to be going in terms of the industry at the moment. So where I'm going to start is really with the uh, information that comes from the CFCA and the CFCA survey. This really is the um, only benchmark that is out there in the industry for fraud uh, in the telco space. Um, the the survey itself has been running for over 12 years now. They perform the survey every couple of years. Um, and the last one was at the end of 2013. Um, so just to start, actually the next survey, uh, people should be just receiving their emails today. It's launching this week. Um, and we'll be doing the survey and trying to gather results uh, and information over the next few months in order to uh, launch the next set of results in October time uh, at the full conference uh, in October. Um, the CFCA survey is distributed not only to CFCA members, but also to uh, members and, uh, of associate groups such as FINA and the GSMA uh, fraud forums and other people as they wish to uh, contribute. We're trying to get over 100 operators and more to actually uh, respond to the survey um, to give it actually statistical significance and value. Um, and of course, from terms of an operator, it gives us great benefit. That is the, uh, the benchmark piece that we have um, in terms of um, looking at from Western Europe, um, but also contributions from uh, the rest of the world. Now, in the next survey, hopefully we can get uh, greater representation from aspects of uh, Latin America uh, and also further in, in Africa and Asia uh, to give us a more global view. So that is something that kind of grows each year uh, and changes each year. So bear that, yeah, we have to bear this in mind in terms of the respondents to the survey. But in terms of the coverage, the survey did actually cover uh, a wide range of operators, uh, international, wholesale, and various different services uh, being provided. Now, in terms of actually the main result of the survey, you know, there's, there's something like 56 pages to the actual survey itself of kind of results and information. But one of the main drivers I take from it 
over the last uh, few surveys is the upward trend. Uh, and this is showing that actually global fraud losses actually showed an increase in the last survey, which is something that probably wasn't expected. Um, and what we need to do is look at why is that? You know, is it just generally fraud is on the rise or is it a factor of approach by operators? And some of that can be probably explained by the fact that, you know, early on, uh, and if you look at the 2005 kind of figures, you know, fraud was a big issue. Not every organization had a fraud department or systems or controls processes in place to deal with those issues. Over the years, we've put those processes in place. Uh, we've put systems in place and put teams in place, et cetera. And that gave us the trend that we expected, the drop in fraud. But over these last couple of years, of course, the market and worldwide economy has been hit uh, by financial recession, downturns, et cetera. So that can create a, a dual impact in terms of fraud losses. One, operators are looking to streamline operations, reduce uh, investments, reduce budgets, et cetera, and therefore investment in fraud protection techniques may have reduced, resulting in an increase in fraud. But also, actually, the, the populace itself, the drive to commit fraud and to uh, find other means and other ways of avoiding charges uh, is also driven by that same commercial pressure they have on their own pockets. So there's kind of a double, double impact from the kind of global shift there. The question really is, is how much of that is operator-driven themselves uh, compared to the actual financial climate they find themselves in? You know, suspicions uh, are around the fact that operators may have taken their eye off the ball. Having a drastic, you know, a 3% reduction in your kind of fraud losses probably means, you know, probably for the average operator, kind of shows that actually we're doing our job well and then there's always the question of well you don't need all that investment or that team because our fraud losses are down and that kind of age-old problem of then of course fraud reoccurs uh, and finds a way as it moves back into that kind of environment but if we look at actually how people are staffing their teams the one kind of factor here is kind of larger departments have found reductions and had reductions uh, in their organizations um, by about 5% from the previous surveys. So that's just showing that actually, although departments across the board in terms of operator sizes were kind of being implemented and taking on responsibilities, um, the larger organizations were looking to reduce their fraud hours positions. You know, and I, I've kind of seen that firsthand myself in working with operators and seeing those kind of 10, 15% cuts across the board across the organization in terms of personnel, you know, reduction restrictions on budgets, et cetera. The other aspect is kind of how the teams are actually split and how organizations kind of manage their time and personnel and the focus they have. One of the questions in the survey was showing how more and more fraud departments actually have cross responsibilities. So they're not purely fraud teams, they're doing aspects of revenue insurance, aspects of credit control, et cetera other roles within the business, which actually takes the focus off uh, the fraud organization uh, and fraud prevention activities. One of the other changes we saw in the marketplace uh, shown within the survey in terms of fraud operations and how we're covered and how we're staffed is the movement to uh, fraud coverage being provided by other organizations outside of the business. So this is a shift, again, had personal experiences over the years, is outsourcing of fraud operations. Whether that's to cover, um, you know, non-standard working hours, uh, as highlighted here in the survey with aspects covering over the weekend, uh, holidays, you know, overnight kind of period hours. Um, but it is a kind of growing factor uh, of the fact that more and more organizations look at that kind of cost reduction and see what we can outsource. Now, some of this might be, again, down to the, the kind of point and click kind of um, aspect of the operation. Can you outsource simple tasks that have simple processes that can be defined uh, and managed by outside agencies and don't need necessarily investigation or technical or, 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 or deep knowledge network, uh, knowledge of the network, in kind of those operations. Um, others, you know, you can kind of, kind of see the positive of this as well in terms of the fact that 
at least coverage is being provided out of hours, at least hopefully that should start to identify fraud situations and manage certain fraud situations that are going on in that kind of coverage. You know, is 27, 24 by 7 coverage better however it's provided, whether that's cost reduction or cost efficient or not? I mean, but there's some of the basics of the kind of what was coming in the survey. The main element, of course, was looking at the fraud side of things. And this is where actually you kind of start to question the value and, and the details of some of the survey as well. Because, you know, the things that we know and the things that we there were still being recorded at the top. Now, the way they, the fraud survey was split, and this was the first time this was done in the 2013 survey, was they started to split it into methods and types. So methods being, you know, uh, how the organizations were actually attacked and how the fraud was committed to actually get on the network and access the service, and types in terms of defining kind of the end point goal of the fraud that was being committed. But we see some of the normal things are still there. Yeah, subscription fraud, PBX hacking, you know, subscription fraud was still the number one fraud being reported. And I think, you know, that has been consistent and still is consistent at the moment. Subscription fraud is the main uh, fraud attack uh, for um, organizations. The increasing, the interesting change was actually around uh, account takeover, because in the, term, in the 2011 survey, account takeover wasn't even on the radar in terms of the top 15, top 20 issues being reported by operators. So that was a massive increase and a massive jump in terms of uh, the situation there in terms of account takeover. Uh, another growth area was, was dealer fraud. Now, in this kind of situation, uh, you, kind of, you know, these kind of things may be all related and could get us to ask questions of, well, why is this happening? Why is this an issue? And, and why, in, in, in the terms of how we've been dealing with fraud for, for many years, have we not started to get a grip you know, of the basics, particularly in the kind of subscription fraud area? So, you know, why is subscription fraud still an issue? You know, it's something that's been around since you know, day dot in terms of fraud, it's, it's always been there. Well, what, you know, there's several kind of issues that relate to this. There's the actual risk reward matrix of dealing with fraud. Because yes, we have increased and improved our in-house and retail checks uh, in terms of controls we're putting in uh, for upfront subscriptions. But of course, the impact of those are limited by risk appetite. The market we're in at the moment means that there is still a desire and a great desire to gain and grow the customer base. So any kind of restrictions in terms of fraud controls on new subscriptions that actually will stop volumes of subscriptions coming through are unlikely to be accepted. So there is still a need to accept a certain amount of fraud via subscription in order to guarantee a certain level of customers. And that is something that you know, um, we in the fraud world need to kind of get a grip of and understand that always that, that kind of risk aspect, that risk appetite will be there from our organizations. And it's how we manage and work with that to kind of find other ways to limit the impact or identify these problems at an early stage. Of course, in a um, tight market, we have the actual pressure themselves so actually on our sales teams, on our agent teams, uh, on our individuals to meet their targets, particularly when we're cutting numbers of staff and reducing our operations. You know, the ones uh, that can lead individuals internally to have a, and cause, you know, an increase the volume of actual internal compromise, internal manipulation uh, by these agents, because they want to be seen as the high performing agent and want to re you know, retain their position, uh, retain their bonus levels, retain their value to the organization, retain their job. Uh, in one way, um, and that pressure to actually grow and streamline at the same time, you know, it kind of gives gives them, you know, gives the incentive for individuals to kind of cut corners and uh, manipulate uh, manipulate the situation. Of course, there is the driver of technology. Uh, over the past few years, particularly in the wireless space, you know, technology has been a big driver. So things like the iPhone 6, iPhone 5, each time a new iPhone comes out, 
um, you know, a fraud seems to grow, particularly in subscription kind of uh, a piece, and you know, the desire to get hold of the handsets and equipment. And it's not only you know, the Apple phones, there's also you know, the latest Samsungs and Sonys, which kind of have a desirability within uh, the industry. The other side of that is now, of course, for the fraudster and for the criminal element, these, these pieces of equipment are easily, you know, they're kind of white goods that are easily resold, easily shipped around the world, easily moved on to different locations. So each time a new piece of technology comes out and is desirable, that will drive that aspect of fraud. And again, you know, the, the base attack level to get hold of handsets have been via subscription. Of course, we have been moving more and more to remote sales and internet sales uh, and automate, automation. Uh, again, that means the technology compromise capabilities of the fraudster is increased as well, because you know, the fraudsters are, you know, don't have to physically um, be located in a store, in a, in a storefront facing into an individual providing identities. They, you know, the aspect of using stolen identities, using uh, fake or created identities, manipulated uh, identities, etc., is much easier to perform in a remote aspect. And of course, you know, that can be, you know, in, often in those situations, remote doesn't mean just around the corner, it can be the other side of the world, with just with an access, to, you know, a, a database of identities to utilize and manipulate. And of course, the kind of, kind of final piece in the chain that kind of points to why this is still an issue and why this is is we've altered our sales models in organizations. We're using more and more third-party alternative channels to uh, sell our products. But of course, again, in our squeeze on revenues and squeeze on our uh, desire and the desire to grow our uh, customer base and our own revenues in terms of growth, we're squeezing these third-party channels very, very hard in terms of reducing their margins, reducing their incentives. <laughs> And so they need to find a way to keep their revenue at the levels they expect. And again, if they find a way to manipulate a sales process, a, a, a commission process, et cetera, they will actually look to do that themselves to actually maintain their own revenue streams. So dealer uh, influence, subscription and application frauds, manipulation, commission sales processes, all these kind of things grow in this kind of environment. The other side of that story, of course, is account takeover. Now, with account takeover, this is because of the change of our focus within our organizations as well. Uh, you know, I've been to many seminars and uh, conferences recently talking, thing, talking with marketing teams where the real focus is on customer retention and churn reduction. So you have the frontline sales team getting new customers, but the uh, inline teams are looking at how they retain what they have and how they maximize the revenue out of them and make sure our customers do not churn and move on to our competition. So we've been looking at making the customer happy, taking the customer on a journey with the operator, with the service provider. Uh, and as such, we're looking to provide services like self-service online uh, to simplify how customers access their details and access their services and can manage their whole interaction with uh, the operator to be as simplistic as possible. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don't know what that was. Um, also in terms of, again, within the organizations themselves, we're looking to re reduce the cost of our customer service operations for individuals. You know, in you know, manual customer service teams, reducing their time uh, on the phone with customers, their average call handling times, et cetera, to make them more efficient and more effective uh, and cost efficient in that manner. And of course, a lot of the controls that we deal with in terms of dealing with existing customers are very much based on simplistic you know, knowledge-based authentication. We expect them to either remember a simple password or, a, you know, they're, you know come up with standard things like date of birth, address, social security number, et cetera. In those kind of situations, uh, knowledge-based authentication is good in terms of the customer experience because they don't have to think very hard and they can access their accounts very, very quickly, but is very, very poor in terms of security levels and control in terms of access to the customer account. 
And of course, this is what the fraudsters are manipulating. They're looking at you know KBA and saying, well, of course, it's easily compromised. It's easy to ring a customer up, pretend to be uh, the service provider, the operator for that customer, um, you know, tell them they've got an issue and get them to verify certain details. That way gives them those details that allows them to, to break that KBA in terms of dealing with uh, either online self-service processes or actually dealing, you know, calling through to agents. So in these kind of situations, social engineering is becoming more and more predominant and more and more a driver uh, within the kind of fraud um, process. You know, we're seeing things like, uh, you know, um, spoofing of uh, customer service numbers. So when they when they call these customers, the number displayed to the customer is actually that of the service provider uh, help desk or service desk. So it makes it look valid. And I know in certain situations and certain operators, you know, in their equipment, they've built in automatic recognition of these numbers. So it actually displays uh, the, the operator name uh, on the, you know, on the handset or on the device saying actually this is, you know, um, ABC Telecom's uh, customer services number who's dialing you. So effective spoofing in that kind of manner can be utilized to social engineer um, the customers themselves. Of course, customer service staff still on the front line, they're also liable to this kind of social engineering. They're, you know, they're, they're being told they need to spend less and less time on the phone with the customer uh, and therefore uh, and make sure that the customer is happy. So if they get a difficult customer or a customer who can't remember their details, what is their incentive? Their incentive is to help the customer as much as possible. Uh, and often in that kind of pressure environment, um, you know, the security things are the first things that goes out the window. Of course, if we look at actually existing customers, the checks and balances we do on existing customers tend to be less than what we would do for a brand new customer. So if an existing customer rang up and, and passed their knowledge base authentication first line of check and then wanted to change their address, change their billing details, et cetera, that would probably be done without another thought uh, being, being had by the customer service agent. Whereas if we were getting a customer coming through and providing a proof of address in a storefront, we'd probably look at validating those details uh, at that point and kind of justifying those at that point, at the application point. This is the same for when you know, customers dial in and do uh, additions to their account, um, you know, add lines, add connections, increase their service levels. These are done without any usual further checks up to a point. Uh, and in the wireless environment, you know, I know kind of situations where an existing customer who's been a customer for more than six months can go and add another, you know, five to ten connections without any further kind of credit checks, validation checks, identity checks, et cetera. Um, because it's an existing customer, you want to keep them happy. You want to do it quickly and efficiently. But, of course, the fraudsters um, know this and target this, uh, you know, uh, very, very particularly. And, of course, in doing so, it gives them greater profit because one attack, I can get, you know, in that kind of scenario, I can get, you know, five to ten extra devices. Whereas I was doing a subscription fraud in a front-level store, I may only get one or two devices. So the value per instant is much higher for the fraudster as well. So this is kind of growing, uh, this kind of this problem, the account takeover, which is why it's been a rise over the past two years and still continuing to be a rise as they manipulate the technologies and self-service uh, options. And we kind of see particular, uh, you know, kind of choke points, whether it's self-service online services, whether it's through customer services or IVR um, flows, or via the agents or internal kind of compromise themselves as well. There is this kind of flow that we have when dealing with customers, and we have the kind of pain points that can occur. You know, we have the kind of situations where social engineering, uh, of agents, of individuals, of customers themselves to get their logon details. There's screen scraping, um, process scraping software out there on the internet that allows them to kind of capture interactions with the online services uh, and actually just direct attacks on the IP networks, you know, um, as well, as well as just, you know, social engineering the agent or the individuals as need be. Further compromise can actually happen internally, whether that's uh, internal agents, you know, uh, within the organization taking data from the services, um, from the databases, 
in terms of you know selling information such as uh, which which customers are good customers, which customers are due upgrades or connections, which customers are allowed extra connections and haven't taken them up on their options, and selling that data on. It can all be also be process abuse. A common thing for ATO in the in the wireless environment is things like um, the lost and stolen uh, process. When a customer rings up and reports their phone stolen. Uh, you know, the handset may be blocked, there may be a, a, an issuing of another SIM card for replacement. Of course, if I go through that process as the fraudster, and I've gone and, or be, before I report the phone stolen, I've compromised the account and changed the address on the account. I then go and report the phone stolen. I then get a SIM replacement activated or go into a store and get a SIM replacement activated. At that point, I've got immediate control of the full account uh, to contact uh, you know, to enact any further kind of situation as I, as I need to. And of course, in the logistics chain itself, the actual dispatching of equipment, devices, uh, connections to customers, uh, again, this can be manipulated. And it's not just the wireless area that this happens on. I've also seen it in, in kind of the fixed environment, particularly the enterprise and business environment, where you have kind of huge com companies as um, customers and you know, they'll add, uh, you know, T1, V1 connections to remote locations, saying it's a new salesperson, new sales team, new remote sales team, and we'll ask for those kind of connections as need be. So looking at kind of the whole logistics manipulation of whether it's endpoint connection, whether it's delivery, a service, you know, utilizing, uh, uh, you know, address mules, address locations, whether it's uh, compromise of actually delivery agents, there's the whole various steps and pressure points that happen there within the ATO cycle. But of course, these are not the only kind of fraud issues that we have. We all, you know, further questions and information came out kind of looking at the fraud types. Now, this is where, um, you know, kind of a couple of issues that we kind of cover here. The highest one reported was roaming fraud. And the third one I'll highlight there, uh, premium rate service fraud. Now, in the modern vernacular, it's really what we're actually talking about is revenue share and international revenue share. So kind of for fixed line operations and, and uh, enterprise operations, they're probably reporting this when filling in this survey as premium rate service fraud, whereas the mobile environment, the environment, may be actually reporting this as, as roaming fraud. So we have a few issues here in terms of actually the categorization and classification within the survey. and. I can tell you, for one, this is something we're changing in the, in the latest survey that's about to come out. Um, hopefully, you as all as, as, as fraud uh, people will actually respond to, because in, in kind of in my view, um, roaming fraud, you know, 99% of roaming fraud actually probably is some form of revenue share manipulation, whether it's uh, whether it's a kind of when roaming, they're calling domestic revenue share numbers, or when roaming, calling other international revenue share numbers. In that kind of situation, it's related to revenue share fraud. Um, there's not a great deal of actually roaming fraud that you can actually quantify in its own manner. You know, what is a roaming fraud? Um, and this kind of rolls in with a kind of premium rate service, and actually does reflect across to the previous years and to other information coming out of other associations, such as reporting the GSMA. From where they're often talking about, you know, revenue share as kind of their main kind of issue. Um, but ignoring kind of those two points and kind of classifying those together as, as under that kind of revenue share banner as a number one, maybe the other points are interesting to me here in terms of aspects of wholesale fraud and wholesale uh, being, you know, one being reported again, which is something that is kind of something new to happen over the past few years is kind of the realization of wholesale has an important part to play within uh, the fraud within the industry, both in terms of actually carriers and intermediate carriers can look to manipulate each other uh, and actually commit fraud against each other to increase their own revenues, but also as much of the international traffic passes over you know, several of these main wholesale carriers, they can have a unique view on what is happening uh, within the industry and get a get a very early view of what is happening within the industry uh, from their from their data and their information that they have because they can see actually what's happening on a worldwide basis as opposed to an individual local basis within an individual operator. 
Another thing for me to highlight is actually that, that driver of fraud over the past two years, the driver of account takeover, and the, you know, the reason for the main, maintaining levels of subscription fraud is the device resale in terms of hardware reselling. And again, this is something that wasn't showing on previous surveys at a very, very at a high level at all. And you know that is kind of you know it's kind of self-explanatory in a way because we know you know the phones we use in terms of the mobile devices we have nowadays are not just a phone; they have other purposes and other uses. And just you know, even as a dead handset, in terms of no connection to the kind of mobile networks. They are still have a value as, a, as an iPod or a, uh, an MP3 player, a, a, phone, uh, uh, a camera, etc. So uh, the, the the value in the hardware is increasing and increasing uh, across the board. <clears throat> One of the things when we look at actually particularly usage fraud and actually uh, utilisation of, uh, of the services, um, an interesting thing for me was actually where fraud actually terminates and looking at um, the kind of crossover of uh, destinations and locations of fraud in this manner some of them or many of them will be well known to many of us who have suffered any kind of revenue share uh, attack or international dialing fraud the likes of latvia gambia Somalia, etc the interesting for me here is that kind of the united kingdom comes in the top 10 and has done in this in this survey um, for the past several years uh, and it kind of highlights the main problem that we have in terms of when we deal with usage fraud detection particularly with moving on to you know the RSS kind of capable uh, uh, issue because in terms of the UK we well in terms of kind of the numbers we have manipulation for revenue share fraud around the actual numbering misuse so there's various aspects that go on we have hijacking of unallocated ranges and I've seen in the um, assessments done within the GSMA of their um, fraud hot list database that many you know, at times is between 10, 10 and 30 percent of the numbers over the years have been actually that are reported as fraud and destinations are actually unallocated ranges so therefore these are calls that should not be connecting to a destination because they haven't been allocated uh, to anybody in that location, but the calls are being passed through the networks and uh, hijacked and intercepted at some point and terminated elsewhere and charged elsewhere. Um, of course, the hijacking can occur on both allocated and unallocated ranges. So we see situations where actual, again, uh, although the numbers are allocated, again they may be not be in use in in the region or in the area. Um, and may not be active, but again being uh, intercepted or routed by certain uh, certain carriers or certain uh, agencies who are actually involved in the fraud. And of course, we have the situations where those uh, countries that have surplus number ranges that have been allocated to them may look to sell them on and pass them on to others, who are then passing them on down the line, down the chain, and those numbers are being eventually allocated uh, and obtained by the fraud and criminal element as well who are actually helping pass on the numbers. And I just wanted to highlight kind of you know, a very simplistic view of a scenario uh, of that, of how it happens and how it issues. Given the UK as an example, we have several number ranges uh, in the UK. You know, we're nominated 4-4 as our international DAR code, but then we break it down into different aspects. And when we look at the different aspects, uh, you can start to see situations that can be manipulated. So here, for example, uh, 444 is an unallocated range currently, as is 446. So although it's been specified as a number range in our numbering plan, currently there are no services allocated to receive calls on that numbering plan. So this is kind of a situation where if a country is passing traffic to the UK and doesn't realise this, and somebody initiates a call to 444 from a foreign destination, um, and you know the third digit isn't looked at, it's just looked at the first two digits, the 44, and said, okay, well, that's the UK, let's route it across the lowest cost route to the UK. Um, and they utilize uh, a carrier who's kind of terminating 
low, you know, providing extra low cost to the UK for that particular day, that particular region or particular area. You have a situation of where those calls can be uh, intercepted and routed, but not actually uh, to a fraudulent uh, carrier operator rather than actually going to the actual destination country. And in that situation, there is no number to call, there is no number to be uh, connected to, so it has to terminate at a fraudulent destination. Now, in terms of that, there's also the ways to hide kind of revenue share fraud and revenue share services. And again, we do that in the UK quite well. In um, the 447 range, we have uh, what is meant to be wireless and wireless connections. Um, within that range, we do have some exceptions. So within there, uh, for example, 4470 is actually a specially rated number or a personal numbering service, which is a kind of follow me anywhere service. Now they are charged at usually a higher rate than the rest of the 447 range. And again, they also have elements of revenue share operations on some of those numbers where the owner of the number will get a portion of the revenue charged. So in that situation, we have revenue, potential of revenue share traffic being hidden in a high volume of genuine uh, wireless traffic to the UK. So it kind of explains why the UK will often turn up on these you know, top 10 destinations for fraud is the fact that we have these kind of numbers that are hidden within our numbering range which allow revenue share services to be operated, but you're not going to block, you know, 447 because, you know, 90% of your UK traffic may be going to the 447 range to actually to mobile numbers and wireless numbers that are genuine. And it's whether you can identify the ones further down that actually are going to cost you more money in terms of connecting those through. And there's other examples of that. But it kind of gives an example and it gives an indication of how uh, the revenue can be um, uh, the revenue share operations can be hidden within them range or misappropriated or allocated uh, or hijacked as need be. There are several providers out there who provide international premium rate numbers as well, you know, which add to this issue of premium rate fraud. There's various test numbers that they uh, produce, etc., and they constantly check and constantly update uh, uh, their numbers and their services looking for weaknesses in the numbering plans of various regions around the world. And these are the organizations that will eventually down, you know, bring you down that chain, purchasing blocks of numbers for those who have uh, you know, more numbers than they need allocated to a their, to their country or destination. Now, one of the other things from the survey that came out was quite interesting was around, obviously, uh, company's revenue and what do you think you're losing to fraud and the most common response was well we're doing very well we're losing less than one percent or less than two percent but of course we have to take a pinch of salt in terms of this this kind of figure in terms of that is what they know of so people reporting the levels of fraud or kind of that is either what they're looking at what they have the responsibility to cover in terms of their fraud operation but actually you know um, they the percentage they may not be aware of, of course, may be much higher. We do have another little peak here at the kind of 5 to 10% region, and kind of questions were asked at this, well, is this less mature fraud operations, people without fraud control systems or uh, fraud teams? Um, but in analysis, what it's actually showing is actually some of the more mature operations actually reporting that level, uh, and not the, not the uh, lesser operators as a common misconception. And that is actually due to the fact that um, they're actually expanding their fraud coverage, so taking more fraud responsibilities on. So again, I've often been, I've been to several operators where they'll have a fraud team and have an operation in place, but their responsibilities may only cover certain aspects of usage fraud, certain aspects of maybe subscription and application, and maybe, uh, maybe that will be it. But of course, what about then the aspects of dealer fraud? What about the aspects of internal compromise, internal fraud situations? If those things are not in your fraud reporting from your fraud team, it doesn't mean they don't exist and go on. But as soon as you take on the responsibilities, you know, it adds to the actual percentage impacts potentially within the fraud operation. And you know, several departments don't want to actually take on the responsibilities 
because they don't want to be seen as actually increasing the percentage of fraud losses actually they're reporting up the chain because they think they may be seen as negative uh, indicators. But actually taking on greater coverage and greater responsibility will actually give you a longer term uh, payback plan for the organization. Now, I mentioned in terms of the fraud there, there's several issues around how we classify and quantify the fraud. And that's something that's come out of um, various surveys and also the information done by the TM forum. So for example, they were asking of, you know, ask themselves the question of, you know, do we need a classification model? Do we across the world need to understand exactly what we're talking about when we talk to each other in terms of fraud? And they uh, asked you know, certain questions, uh, highlighting certain fraud scenarios and ask people to respond on how would they classify the fraud. And as you can see here, for one fraud scenario, they got several kind of uh, elements that were added into the um, uh, into the responses. So TM, fraud, uh, um, TM Forum has gone away and said, okay, what are the issues? What, are we, what do we have? We have issues of where we've got the same name, uh, uh, sorry, the same fraud type that have got different names across the globe. Uh, a good example of that was highlighted recently uh, at one of the GSMA meetings where we're talking about proxy fraud. Now, in the Asia Pacific region, region proxy fraud is often um, talked about as an individual who is uh, manipulated into you know, purchasing a, a, a contract or connection and providing their identity as a sort of fraudster with their knowledge. In the US, the term for that would be credit mulling. Um, and their term for proxy fraud actually is looking at IP attacks and IP proxy attacks. So we have two people describing the same fraud in different ways and the same term being used in two different ways in two different parts of the world as well. This it makes, makes it very hard for us as fraud professionals, one, to talk together clearly in terms of when we're talking about fraud issues, and two, to actually you know, bring our KPIs and, uh, and uh, benchmarking indexes together if we're referring to fraud differently in different regions. And of course, you know, the fact that fraud has multiple dimensions. So you can have a PBX hack uh, that is, you know, a, well, social engineering that leads to a PBX hack. The PBX hack leads to a, a, a international dialing which will lead to revenue share fraud and maybe go you know, uh, and, and cause other problems as well. So there's kind of links within the fraud that actually goes from point to point to point and, and makes it difficult to kind of uh, accurately talk about the fraud effectively. And that was highlighted in the CSCA survey when we talk about roaming fraud. You know, off the top of my head, you know, I can't think of anything that I would actually classify as roaming fraud that wouldn't have a different fraud element to it. So, i.e., a roaming fraud, well, how did I get the subscription? Was it a subscription fraud? Was it an account takeover? Was it a SIM swap manipulation, et cetera? When I go roaming, what kind of call activity did I do? Did I then do it dialing to premium rate numbers, to international revenue share numbers, et cetera? So there's different elements to a fraud that we kind of classify all in one group as roaming fraud, but actually, if we break it down, we'll have a better understanding of what has actually happened. So. The TM Forum have been working on a classification model. This is something now being deployed within FINA and the FINA reporting uh, structures for fraud reporting to try and use the same classifications, the same descriptions for the fraud types, but split it uh, into steps. And you know, simplistically, there's a nice little diagram here showing how they talk about enablers and uh, actually the fraud types and how this relates to the business. But the simplistic element of this is kind of breaking into two steps in terms of, okay, the enabler. How did they get on the network? How did they get service access to commit the attack? And then we have the descriptions for each type of potential uh, enabler uh, fraud element. And then the second part of it is, okay, what is the actual fraud type? How are they looking to generate revenue from fraud? Could we know? 99% of the fraud type that we uh, suffer from are actually relevant to generating revenue. So if we kind of classify it in this way, we have a kind of two-step model of one, how did they attack the network, and two, what were they trying to achieve? The CFCA survey was trying to get that kind of uh, model um, put in into the survey, 
but again, it hasn't quite got its definitions aligned. So we're trying to look at, okay, now we have those two steps. Can we align the definitions on which element falls into which step? So a PBX attack would fall under enabler, and the endpoint, the fraud type, may be international revenue share. Uh, and this, can, can we split it in those two ways? Can we split our understanding in those two ways? So when we look at reporting fraud and looking across the global at what's happening, we can actually break it down in terms of we understand how they're attacking us and which technologies and services they're attacking, and we can understand of how they're trying to make their money so we can put in the appropriate process controls around you know, stopping the money flow to those individuals, therefore taking away uh, the driver for the fraud attack in the first place. However, you know, the CFCA also, uh, sorry, the TMF also did a survey this year um, looking for other aspects of uh, fraud information. And they were asking about this classification guide and how people classifying fraud at the moment. And, you know, this is, as I say, because I think it's a common cause for misunderstanding of where we, where we are in terms of the various fraud threats. And as you can see, you know, 20% of the respondents that came back were saying they use an ad hoc definition of when they classify fraud. So that can change from you know uh, individual to individual, time to time, organisation to organisation, which is not it's not great when we try and talk about fraud on a global level. Again, several organisations are using their own, so they've got a kind of standard classification with their own organisation, their own systems, but it's limited to that. Okay, again, that doesn't necessarily translate across. But only 10% so far are, are using uh, an industry model. Now, as mentioned, FINA are looking to move to uh, a industry standard classification, and we need to look across the globe. Do we want to kind of bring that model with us to actually um, agree a kind of template together? So at least when we talk about certain types of frauds, mention certain types of issues, we do actually cross uh, cross that knowledge and, and cross those boundaries of, of description and classification so we can actually understand how we are um, working together and how we are developing. Now, again, there are about uh, close to 40 questions, I think, in the TMF uh, survey on fraud. Um, but what I'd like to highlight is just kind of one other point that kind of came out and actually look at fraud teams themselves and performance and how it can improve fraud teams. Now, looking at kind of the short-term performance and respondents coming back of how they would look to improve their own performance, one of the things that was really uh, outstanding and the highest one was actually to look at training in the fraud area. And again, this is something that actually there isn't a great deal of industry-led fraud training programs out there. Um, so kind of looking at how, if training is a major driver to improving your performance within your fraud organization, um, we, you know, the industry itself, we need to address that. And again, that is something all the associations are now looking to try and address, and we'll be looking to try and address over the next uh, couple of years, uh, you know, including um, you know, work with each other and work with the kind of the, uh, the kind of vendors and service providers in the industry to try and see what we can do to do that. I mean, other things we're looking at, okay, can we look at maturity models? Can we look at um, implementing and, and uh, improving tools and systems? Those are things that obviously uh, are more obvious. But uh, the, the thing to me was the fact that a, a training seems to be a driving force across the industry of, how we get uh, our teams to improve their performance. But going on and moving on in terms of talking about the fraud trends and fraud issues, that kind of highlights the things we report about. And, it, and this is where we have this dichotomy today of what is going on, because we have the issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and such as subscription fraud, account takeover, PBX hacking, etc. These are the things we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and we kind of fall into that remit of they're the norm and that is the norm. But actually kind of trying to address those and, uh, you know, it's not, as, it's not as sexy, it's not as, we don't have as much enthusiasm to get those 
uh, issues addressed anymore because they've been going on for such a long time. So actually hearing the fact that they're still the problem uh, is probably not too exciting. But in the media and in the marketplace at the moment, obviously there is this kind of shift to this cyber conversation that seems to be driving various changes within the industry as well. So we have this perception of, you know, and I say in inverted commas, what they call cyber attacks. So it's, you know, things across the internet, you know, uh, again, the social engineering manipulation, phishing, vishing, spamming, all these kind of uh, uh, lovely kind of terms that are utilized, you know, IP, IP attacks, scams, botnets, etc. So there's all various things that are out there and the perception is these are new kind of threats and they cross over with other aspects. So we get cyber terrorism, et cetera, and so on. But it's kind of coming back to us within uh, the telco industry because taking that forward, we have issues. And those issues being pushed upon us are things around consumer protection. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of one example. So we have the US president saying, we're saying okay, we've got to make um, cyber security safer, make our customers safer. Well, when we're talking about account takeover situations and their data being uh, accessed or compromised by social engineering, you know, the common uh, misconception is maybe, you know, it's a, it's a result of this kind of attack. It's a result of a cyber attack. Uh, how did they get the data? How did they get the information, et cetera? What did you do to protect my data? And this is where we have this kind of issue with our customers, of course, of our, you know, our customer service teams, our marketing and sales teams want to make the customer happy and give them easy access to their data. But again, that comes back to us in terms of when the fraud happens is, well, you didn't protect me. How did you, how did they access my data, et cetera? So we have this kind of fight against the uh, perception of the industry of what we're doing in terms of consumer protection and what can we do in terms of protecting their you know, their identities when it is their identity to protect. Going further, and a big discussion in, in, in a lot of meetings I've been to recently is around actually integrity of the networks as well. So have we moved to all, I, you know, all IP networks, uh, looking even at the old technology networks being compromised now by um, the capabilities of, uh, of, of you know, uh, the computers and you know, technology available for the criminal element to uh, cause us issues is growing from what it was. So we have situations like the SS7 network now uh, being reportedly potentially compromised and at risk. We have to move to IP networks and how secure are they going to be if we go all IP and the various risks? Do we really understand it? Do we have to um, do we have to control it, and where does that uh, um, responsibility sit, and how does that impact us in fraud? Because you know, a comment made to me uh, the other day at one of these kind of conferences was, well, any security incident therefore leads to a fraud compromise, and any fraud compromise is always the result of some security incident or integrity incident, and how this actually relates and. Does that actually, is that really true or is that the perception of the industry and how do we manage that again within our own organizations? And these may be pressures that are starting to push on our floor teams now. Again, touching on data security and privacy issues. Um, again, reports recently about the, you know, the, uh, the should we say, inverted commas, governmental attacks on um, network infrastructure, encryption codes on, on mobile devices, etc. That causes issues um, with us in terms of the public perception of what is happening and, and how it is managed and how it is controlled. So again, we have to address that in terms of how do we address our own internal processes, how we work with our business partners, how we engage with these kind of organizations, etc. And again, how we put the perception out to our customers. Excuse me for a moment. Um, and of course, then we come to fraud itself and fraud being implemented over the inverted commas, the internet and you know, the cyberspace uh, aspect. Our organizations and um, uh, legal organizations and criminal anti-criminal crime organizations are now setting up 
task forces, groups to specifically focus on the inverted commas cyber crime attacks. Again, that will bring a question to us to us within our organisations of uh, how we kind of manage that situation and how we uh, what are we doing in our own team, what are we doing in our environment to manage the fraud via these methodologies whether that be malware situations, again, attacks on our online self-service portals, all those kind of uh, online sales channel manipulations, all those kind of things become threats that potentially we're going to have to deal with and manage more and more in the future and work with other aspects of the business that we haven't had to deal with before. So one of the kind of things we're talking about, well, of course, this is where we kind of cross over into that, you know, what are we talking about in terms of cyberspace? Because we have the public internet you know the googles of this world where you can go and source information where you can go to information sites and find things on how to commit particular types of fraud attacks at a base level and then we have the underground market you know the dark net as it were you know uh, core etc where this is where the, you know, the criminals actually manipulate their business and, and manage their business in terms of selling information, managing information, et cetera, you know, full in-depth tutorials for sale and various kind of pieces. And the kind of information they're going through, the various different scams and scenarios that are on there uh, and at different levels, depending on whether it's public or dark information that's been done. Now, you know, many people may have read about, you know, the kind of this, this Silk, Silk Road kind of um, websites uh, the darknet sites where you know the credit card information has been uh, sold on uh, and obtain, you know, obtained and sold on. You know, some of these are accessible, some of these are not acceptable to the everyday individual. Um, the fact that you know it actually exists though is an issue that we have to deal with, and kind of can we kind of source and look at the information? And if we look at those, you know, the kind of examples. So yes, you get user groups and information exchanges looking at fraud techniques, guides to hacking and social engineering. As I mentioned, you get data purchase provision services and, you know, various technical uh, compromised data as well. So you can look at examples like, you know, SIM card manipulation, stealing people's data, et cetera, how you can get information on those. You can get PBX hacking guides and techniques and, and, and data scripts uh, as well. Uh, other examples include uh, account takeover guides and you know, I've seen some of these where they actually take you through per operator, the type of operator to go to, um, and the, the methods they use, the self-service portals they use, um, the kind of questions and validation they use, et cetera. So it helps you kind of go through uh, the whole process. Uh, and, you know, they, they will resell these information to each other. And as you can see, they use Bitcoin to purchase these transactions as well to make it kind of, a little bit more untraceable in terms of where the revenue is going through. So there's various examples out there in terms of what is going on in terms of the industry, uh, in terms of this kind of cyber mechanisms and the perception out there. But that perception is driving a change. You know, organisations are now looking to address that and change the way we work. Now, so we're having to deal with our traditional fraud issues, but respond to the perception of the cyber threat. So we're seeing organizations change. And if we look at some of this change, if we look at you know, something taken from the CSA survey, again, is like, where is the fraud department situated? You know, we had respondents to that in 2013, but actually we're seeing a movement of fraud operations back with security functions. So there was a close to nearly a 10% move in the 2013 survey. It'd be interesting to see if this has continued into 2015 when we do the next survey in these next few meet, a few months. Will we see this move of fraud and security being closer together again, as it were, from fraud and finance, where it was very much, you know, the aspect was fraud and insurance rather than fraud and security. In organisations, we're seeing this change as well. Now, some of this has been uh, forced rather than actually uh, voluntary voluntarily driven, but the GSMA has combined two of its uh, main working groups, the Fraud Forum, who were the operational fraud uh, personnel, and the security group. Uh, and the security group, you know, very much technical experts in encryption, algorithms, SIM technology, etc. Those two groups have been brought together to create um, 
the new combined group as one working group. The idea and perception is to enable these groups to work together on these cyber threats and new technology threats as they come forward um, and allow them to be addressed from the very first point in terms of both the technology and then look at the perceived fraud risks that kind of are based around that technology to enable the operations teams to understand what they need to manage those threats as they go forward. Now, that's going to take time for these kind of two groups to work together because in the past they've worked independently as teams but exchanged information. Now they're going to have to work together. But we need to remember it's you know, often two totally different sets of personnel and mentalities in terms of trying to get those people to work together. But they're not the only ones that have moved in this direction. Uh, again, the TM Forum has also started to move in this direction. So that had a revenue management group that was looking at, you know, it had aspects of billing and fraud and revenue assurance. Um, they're now moved under security to include aspects of privacy and data security teams under a kind of, you know, um, a security directorate rather than within the kind of the billing and BSS OSS kind of space. So it's a kind of interesting move, uh, an interesting shift. And some of it will actually be very familiar to you, those of you who have been, you know, in the industry a while, like myself. Because if you think about where fraud did come from, fraud often started with security groups. You know, and I'm kind of talking back in the, you know, 70s, 80s, uh, early 90s, kind of where Fraud was part of security. People were very much event focused, investigation focused. The security individuals who we had and the fraud individuals we had were probably ex law enforcement kind of uh, or ex special services kind of personnel, um, but used to dealing with kind of security incidents and uh, criminal incidents, should we say. And in terms of the technology we used, again, you know. Often it was said, it was said at a conference uh, two weeks ago by the chairman of FINA, you know, it used to be in-band signaling and, you know, real-time analysis looking into the data in terms of looking for DTMF tones and using SS7 probes, as it were, to try and intercept the calls and intercept the actions as they happened. In the kind of mid-term and kind of, kind of up to now, what it has been, though, there's been that kind of shift as, well, you know, fraud is more a financial commercial risk Let's put it with part of finance. Let's integrate RA because fraud and RA are a similar kind of operation. And individuals are very much revenue focused. More audit personnel were kind of brought in, and finance personnel were brought into fraud teams. The movement went away from real time analysis to kind of um, near real time or kind of as, as close as could be, as long as we can kind of manage and uh, measure the issue. And much more focus was put on around risk analysis um, and product risk analysis of payments and processes and actually uh, managing the revenue streams in terms of managing the risk and the risk levels in relation to the financial uh, well-being. So where does that take us? Where do we think we're going? Well, that is the kind of question now in terms of, well, is it something where fraud comes back as part of security? Do we tie in fraud and security together again? Or is it more of a kind of matrix outlook that we should be expecting where, depending on the type of incident, you know, certain teams within the organization should work together? There is this kind of question over, well, maybe we get a bit more analytics focused, but still remain retain our commercial now, our commercial understanding so we can put these aspects together. So we know the security risk but we have the financial understanding of what the level of that risk is and how that potentially would impact our product. Bring in the security expertise into our fraud kind of teams, bring in that technical knowledge, the network knowledge, the infrastructure knowledge, particularly moving to IP. But again, do we go in terms of the analytics space, go back to more real time analytics and again, going back to content. If these kind of cyber threats are hidden in the internet and in our IP and data streams, then maybe do we need to go back to kind of content analysis and looking at DPI? And, you know, this is a question, so these are the aspects that we're kind of seeing across the board. Some people are taking those kind of points on. Some people are looking at those points um, at the moment. So we're, getting, we're in that kind of review stage within the industry, and that seems to be the trend at the moment, looking at where we are in terms of 
where do we go in regards to maturity as a fraud? Because does this growth of data, you know, the movement to IP and this perception of cyber threats, do, you know, do we need to look at our approach? Because at the moment, all, many of those threats would not be visible in our traditional setup, in our normal setup as it is at the moment. So, again, do we need to go back to in-depth analysis to understand what is happening across our data stream in order to provide several things? Yes, to protect against fraud, but also protect our consumer against social engineering attacks and, and uh, manipulation, um, but also controlling security and, um, you know, kind of uh, security and more kind of, uh, kind of global security threats, anti-terrorism threats, et cetera because that information is in there. So, you know, a lot of the discussions I'm having and people are having uh, across the world at the moment is, well, is now that time to use DPI? It's something you know, people discussed in the past and, in in, 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 uh, you know, a few years ago, but never really got traction. And people never really understood could it be used, how it could be used. Um, and, but we did use kind of SS7 and detail analysis in the, in the, in the you know, 15 years ago, as it were. Um, but what we see now as well is actually organizations in uh, our, uh, sorry, departments in our organizations are actually utilizing DPI for other means. So the technology is already there. It's not a technology we have to take on in a fraud area ourselves. It's something that's already been used for network teams who are managing quality of service over data channels now. Uh, and, and, you know, looking at this kind of structure and, and maintenance of the network, as well as our marketing teams and marketing analytic teams are using DPI to understand customer behavior, customer segmentation, you know, customer analytics in order to offer them, uh, you know, the best experience and services and understand what type of customer and how they, you know, uh, how they interact with the network. This kind of analysis is something that, you know, can be utilized from a fraud perspective in terms of providing that consumer protection layer, fraud identification at an early stage, as well as kind of more general security protection. Uh, but of course, that also opens up the other issue of doing that kind of analysis requires large volumes of data to be analyzed. But again, our organizations are already one step ahead of us in terms of planning for that, because the whole aspect of big data is something that's kind of the byword now in the industry is, from an IT perspective, storage, data maintenance, data management within the organization is being put in, in terms of these big data solutions. But what we need to understand is um, look at how we utilize and make effectiveness of that data there. So that is something, again, where fraud can make, make a difference and make, take control of that kind of situation. So that is kind of, <laughs> in brief an overview of kind of the situation as it is in terms of traditional kind of fraud threats, where we're going in terms of uh, the trends and discussion points in the industry at the moment uh, and various other pieces uh, highlighted by uh, aspects that are kind of shown by some of the past surveys and conference discussions and uh, um, operator discussions that uh, I've had and been involved in. Um, and also within the industry associations, the various discussions and issues that are going on there. Um, had to try and squeeze it all into an hour and not quite succeeded, but we're more or less there. Uh, hope it was of interest and if there's any questions, um, you know, feel free to pop those through on the chat or, or via email uh, as, need, as, you, as you wish. Thank you. My uh, email address is on there, so if anybody wishes to send any kind of comments or issues or uh, questions, feel free to email me at any time and I'll do my best to respond. I hope this is a useful hour and a few minutes. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, hopefully talk to you all again soon.